Good evening. Let me introduce myself once more. My name is Ksenia Yevgenievna, my last name is Menshikova. Those of you who know me already, that's good. Those who have forgotten me will remember me pretty quickly. Today we start the first basic course of the Liberation of Consciousness program, the main department in our school, which consists of seven main courses, understandably as many as the number of human subtle bodies. And not in vain, as our school is named Consciousness, thus we do work on the expansion of consciousness in many different areas. Within the time frame of our introductory lesson, we talk about the reasons why one should be expanding their consciousness, why it is needed, what meaning it has, what for, and why people don't like doing it. I will answer the second question first, because it is difficult. It is really difficult. And do people like difficulties or not? No. People don't like to work hard, even when they say they're opposite. Humans are generally built this way, not because humans are so bad and ignorant. The fact is that this is the way of human nature. Human nature longs for peace, as strange as it may sound. But nonetheless, civilization must develop somehow. Reality has to move forward one way or another. In this world, human beings are the only creatures capable of achieving this. What can be done with them if they don't wish to do that? They will need to be stimulated in some way. But how do people get stimulated when it comes to their progress in life? What is the way to stimulate someone for them to start doing anything? Right, to organize a certain sequence of events that the person will have no other choice left other than to do something. At the same time, there are generally two categories of people. The first one is of the opinion that one should act independently and that in life you can't count on anybody. These people prefer searching for the sources of their problems within themselves. The second category of people believes that a problem can only be solved collectively and that no solutions can be found independently. Given the quite understandable reasons for failures, misfortunes and difficulties in the lives of these people, do you think they will search for problems inside or outside of themselves? Rather outside, because of this holy conviction that it is feasible only if approached collectively. And that if everybody doesn't want to do so, then I can do anything on my own. So whose fault is it? Everyone else's. Those who are lazy, mean and inert. In general, people can be roughly divided in these two categories. There are not many reasons for this, there are some, a few. And we will try to understand the reasons why people think in certain categories using certain characteristics. We will try to notice a certain regularity, not just to try to be clever and theorize on this topic, but for you to have a tool at hand that will allow you to unequivocally see what the deepest motivation of a given person is. Namely, where does he or she look for the source of their problems and the source of their solutions, within themselves or outside? And as a consequence, we will not place unrealistic expectations on them because the given person will not meet them. And then it will be you who will be left with the problem, with the loss, not them, because it was you who had certain expectations. This way, when we start looking at people not as a certain general category, as a certain general mass, in which everybody should be the same, we begin to do a very important thing for our consciousness. We slowly start to get rid of illusions. Illusions are a terrible thing in our world, especially this world we live in that is built upon illusions. All of reality is built on illusions. All of our needs are mainly illusory, artificial, forced upon us. These fictitious needs are called simulacra in psychology. It is like an imposed need, an invented need that isn't actually a need of the body, 
nor a need of the mind, nor a need of the soul, but merely a need of product manufacturers and advertising companies to sell you something, to force something upon you, or do something for you. But because the information is so dense and its pressure on the person so high, it becomes difficult to identify on the spot which need is actually theirs and which has been imposed. What is really needed or where the proposed method of satisfaction of one's need is but a result of the cultural environment we live in. This is what you will need this tool for, so you can answer this question correctly. This tool is quite harsh, this tool is quite powerful, and this tool, as any other tool, has two sides. Each coin has two sides. On the one side, this tool allows you to clearly understand what you need and what you don't really need. And on the other side, it separates you from those not in possession of this tool. On one hand, it is a good weapon to have. On the other hand, it will not always please you with its results. And only those capable of seeking the problems within themselves will be able to use this weapon, this tool, worthily and rightly, namely without ever renouncing it. Whereas those used to seeking the problem and its source as well as its solutions in the outside world will not be able to handle these two. It will make them lonely. And loneliness for such a person will become the reason for a wrong attitude towards life. This instrument is called the base state I am as I am. This is what I will teach you. This is the tool I want to give you. But the safety rules and instructions must be stated first. For this reason, I tell you from the start, the more you utilize this technique, the more you utilize this method, the clearer you will see the difference between your actual needs and the needs that were imposed upon you. Revelations might occur, and you should be ready beforehand for such revelations. Not because they will destroy your life, not at all. They will simply show you all the mistakes you have made in the past, surrendering to convictions from others that made you believe that this peculiar need that you are trying to satisfy with your time, your money, your health, your relationships has actually nothing to do with you. Here a regret might appear for the years lived pointlessly and for the uselessly spent time. But trust me, it is better to know than not to know. If you agree with me, and you do, then we will carry on with our learning, then I will tell you about it. So we will start by trying to understand what consciousness is and why one should be expanding it. Those of you who have read my books and have possibly listened to some of my lectures on the internet know that we work with the consciousness by roughly dividing it into seven levels. I repeat, this division is conditional because the subtle bodies, the ones we give names to because we are working with them, are certainly not separated from one another. It is impossible to pick each one of them out as a distinct substance and distinctively work with them that way. Nonetheless, we do conditionally separate them according to one parameter that allows us to do so. This parameter is a different combination of energy and information. And before I tell you how these energo-informational processes, namely the partition of energy and information, take place in the subtle bodies, as judicious people who hear words and are used to unpacking them in our consciousness in a certain way, we have to agree upon the terminology. Therefore, the first thing we will do is agree upon what we mean by the word energy and what we mean by the word information. 
This way we avoid incidents, because it might be that we think about the same things, but it also might be that we think about totally different things. So let's discuss this topic. What is energy? It is a common word, we use it so often. An energetic person, energetic. What does this mean? Power, absolutely right. A certain potential. Let's brainstorm. What more ideas do we have? They move, they are active. In other words, they have power for movement. We say of an energetic person that they don't just have power, they apply it and use it in the outer world. So let's conditionally agree that energy is power, just power. Positive energy, negative energy, or any other kind of energy, these are details that just characterize power, not more. Dark, light, let's leave this aside. Just power. Now let's move over to information. Let us try to understand what information is. Let's pull out of our mind all we know about it. Inner knowledge, good, more. Power that surrounds us, everything around us. We can say so as well. Give me more. In other words, energy is in fact something concrete, a certain individuality. It is defining, it helps us distinguish one thing from another or unite one thing with another. Therefore, information is a method of redistribution of energy, we may say so. Information is what makes energy different, meaning positive energy or negative energy. You take energy, put it together with information, and it becomes positive or negative. Such is information. It has allowed us to divide the energy. Respectively, we can suppose that this dividing and uniting method, the method of tying and untying different types of energies in this world, is information. So this is how we are going to perceive it. But what do we actually need this for? Let's go back to the beginning. The fact is that the subtle bodies that we will be working with during the course and all the following courses vary from one another just by the different relative quantities of energy versus information present within them. And there is a law, an immutable, eternal law, that applies to everything in this world, including human consciousness. And the law states that information is ontologically, existentially, always stronger than energy. Information can rule energy, but never the other way around. And we shall remember this law because the entire creation is built upon it. In this world, it is possible to take as much energy as you want and from wherever you want to, depending on information. Information dictates exactly how, what, why and what for. That's right. And energy without information is chaos, not structured by anything, a gigantic force. And it is only when information appears this force gains concreteness, gains form, and thereby meaning, and thereby direction. It is in this respect that we will be working with these two concepts. And in general, this is just knowledge, a theory. But this theory will come to serve us to a greater degree when we will try to understand all the processes that take place within our consciousnesses in order for us not to depend on them, but for them to depend on us. And this is a very important objective that we set for ourselves, not just for this one course, we set it for our entire study for as much as we can take it up to the seventh course. We want to make sure that we don't depend on inner or outer processes. We must do so that the inner and outer processes depend on us. 
This is called absolute freedom. Freedom is independence. The question is, independence of what and what from? And I am telling you that we will be attaining precisely this effect. Independence from the chance, independence from information and energy, and from their spontaneous appearance. We want to make them foreseeable and even self-created. And this is certainly hard work. It is an enormous, painstaking work. First of all, because it will require us to understand a lot of things within ourselves and the reasons that allow different strange things and accidents to happen and the dependence on the surrounding reality. All of these reasons exist and have to be understood. Moreover, if I should tell you what they are, it would be nothing but information. But if you are able to pull it out with your own effort, meaning to invent the gunpowder and the wheel on your own, then believe me, this step will be of much greater value to you. Therefore, we start the expansion of our consciousness first of all with a theory of how our consciousness is structured. And let's repeat once more that we distinguish seven subtle bodies differentiated just by the conditional combination of energy and information within them. One above the other, we draw seven lines. and start naming them from the bottom. The lowest line will be the physical body. This is the first level of our consciousness, and strangely enough, the physical body is indeed a part of our consciousness. 